stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. Tonight, John Pounders and I are going to be bringing you a presentation entitled The Hellfire Club, Satan's Change Agents. We're going to be looking at the fascinating history of the Hellfire Club, and we're going to be looking at how Satan uses secret societies to transform and change the world we're living in. And... The best thing about this broadcast is you're not going to have to wait very long for it because it all starts right now because we're now live, live, live. What's up, guys? Glad to be here in the Puritan Barn with David once again. And this show tonight is going to be amazing. And this is going to give us insight into really how a lot of the powers that work that gathered their power and how they formed together and just the sheer amount of wickedness that um, goes on in the world, and there's no there's no mistaking where a lot of this stuff boils from. So tonight, this is going to be awesome. Let us know where you guys are from in the chat. Let us know what you guys are got going on, and uh, we will be right back after a word from our sponsors. Many mainstream companies put dangerous chemicals in their products that contribute to disease and disability. This is why it's so important that we take care in the products that we consume. The skin is the largest organ in your body, and it is the covering to your temple. Our sponsor tonight is Sugar and Spice Soap Company. They create all natural and biblically clean soaps and beauty products. They even have a soap for Midnight Ride listeners. Use coupon code NYSTV to receive 10% off all your purchases. Link in the description. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the like the book of the dead it's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil and we are back tonight on Now You See TV. And if you guys are interested in any of those sponsorships, go down in the link below and you'll see links there. And so make sure to check that stuff out. Uh, also, we got other shows coming up this week, Breaking Babylon. Um, David, you guys have some shows coming up. Your uh, Sunday night live show is coming up as well. What is that going to be about? It's going to be the final episode of the Atlantis trilogy that Brian Reese and I have done on our FOJC Radio Rumble channel. So that will be on Sunday night, 8 p.m. on FOJC Rumble channel. So join us for that. It'll be a blessing for you. I guarantee it. Very good. So, David, tonight the topic, the Hellfire Club, it's been made pretty popular recently, and I'm not 100% sure the root of the popularity. I've been seeing people wearing these shirts all over the place that say Hellfire Club on it. And uh, I think it was made popular, if, I, if I'm remembering correct, there was a character on Netflix on the series, um, oh my goodness, Stranger, uh, Things. Stranger Things, that mm-hmm. was wearing the shirt, and, I'm, and it might be a band, I have no idea, but it's definitely been a popular um, concept lately, and on...
top of that, it's about those rear gallet or let's do it. Let's ride. Let's right. ride. And tonight we're going to be, you know, it's shocking. Um, the terrific evil that many of our leaders and founding fathers were involved in just horrific evil, but it was an evil genius. And we're going to be looking at how these people used this hellfire and other groups like it to transform society. There was a method to their evil. There certainly was. And this book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, this was written in the 1980s. And in the early 1980s, I was one of the first to speak out against the New Age movement as it really began to explode in the early 80s. And this book was like a handbook for the New Age movement. And, you know, a lot of people say, boy, uh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Well, this laid out that indeed there was a conspiracy and it was a handbook on how to disseminate New Age ideas to transform society, which are just basically satanic ideas. But in this book that came out in 1980, of uh, on page 24 it says there are legions of conspirators they are in corporations universities and hospitals on the faculties of public schools oh yeah in universities factories and doctors offices and state and federal agencies on city councils and the white house staff they have coalesced into small groups in every town and institution. They have formed what one called national non-organizations. Some conspirators are keenly aware of the national, even international scope of the movement and are active in linking others. They are at once antenna and transmitters, both listening and communicating. They amplify the activities of the conspiracy by networking and pamphleteering, articulating the new options through books, lectures, school curricula, even congressional hearings and national media. Their goal is social transformation. And this is certainly they have done well i remember the world as it was in 1980 was a far cry from the world that we live in now there are things now that are commonplace that just would not have taken place there and our society has been transformed because of people that are change agents they want to get into whatever institution they can get into and they want to change it and what they want to change it from are any norms and moral absolutes that come from the Word of God. This is about Satan's war on God's law. And we're going to be unpacking that in, in the history of just how they did that. Now, this is a fellow here, Francisco Rubelice, and he was involved in the Benedictine order, and he was also a Franciscan monk, and I guess he didn't like it too well. And in 1535, he began writing a series of novels where there was a giant called Gargantua, and this giant Gargantua built the Abbey of Thelema. Now, I've been quite familiar with Mr. Crowley and done a, took a, been looking at him for a number of years now, but I never knew until researching for this broadcast tonight that the Abbey of Thelema and Do What Thou Wilt is the whole of the law. Crowley did not originate it. It come from this fella here, Franciscios Rabelais. And it is just amazing that he wrote like five novels that were published in the 1500s. They, it became very popular. And, of course, uh, in, in Mr. Uh, Gargantua, and here's some just, these pictures are just really wild, of Gustav Dorr, of this uh, giant Gargantua. And he was a very fleshly, of course. He enjoyed uh, all of his fleshly indulgences. And Gargantua built the Abbey of Thelema, where it wasn't just men there, but they had the men and the women there. 
and they were free to do anything they wanted to have their orgies and do what they'll wilt was the law of the Abbey of Thelema started not by Mr. Alistair Crowley, but by this man, Francios Rabelais. Now, this is the basic concept that was laid down for the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club, and we should say the Hellfire Clubs, they were based upon the concept of Rabelais Abbey of Thelema built by this, uh, this giant, the Nephilim Gargantua. And this fella here is very important in the history of the Hellfire Clubs. He really started the first one, and he started it in London in 1720. Now, you're going to appreciate this timeline. I'll give you a, a three historical bullet points here. In 1717, the Grand Lodge of England started, the Grand Lodge, Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in, uh, in England. In 1720, three years later, Philip, the Duke of Wharton, started his Hellfire Club with 40 elite people in London, both men and women, based upon the Abbey of the Lima, do what they will, they and they did whatever they wanted. And it got, you, you know, they just did every debaucherous thing they wanted to do. And then two years later in 1722, Philip the Duke of Wharton became the head of all Freemasonry, the Grand Master of all Freemasonry. So 1717, the lodge started. 1720 he starts his hellfire club two years later he's running the whole thing and mr hellfire club so this is a real glimpse into you know when you get people together and uh you, you know all this stuff about them i tell you what it helps you move right up to the top and this is an old game this has been played for a long time and it's the basic way that satan operates to move his people right up the ladder yeah it's a it's we were talking about this before the show, but it's such a good way for these people to get their feelers out. I think in the book you read, it, t it talked about being a feeler. It's uh, getting your feelers out to see who is wicked along with you. Who who can you trust to go above and beyond the wicked stage with you? And they start to filter people through this process, man. It's amazing. But, you know, in, in, in Evansville, for instance, David, the guy that probably has the most power in Evansville isn't the mayor isn't the sheriff, isn't anybody like that. It's a guy that actually owns a strip club. He owns a strip club. He procures the different things. The, is, uh, some would say he's in uh, does human trafficking. Some would say he's a drug trafficker. But this guy um, is friends with all the powerful people and in a very powerful position um, as a strip club owner. So you, know, you can only imagine the kind of parties this guy has put together and probably – uh, how much dirt he has on a lot of these people. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely, it's, uh, that's the way that this has rolled for a long, long time, and that's the way it still rolls today. No doubt about that. I think that's one reason the, the Scripture warns so heavily against it. We've been going through the Book of Proverbs series on the website, and one of the things that just warns so much against is just falling um for the fleshly activities because all of these fleshly activities end up end up to a point to where you may end up in the middle of one of these hellfire clubs and next thing you know you've gotten yourself compromised in these positions this happens a lot with people yeah yeah and it's so easy uh to trap politicians or law enforcement people in this and um it's uh it's a game they play very well now, in the, in the big picture here, what we've got, what we're going to see unfold, as Mr. Rebles, he came up with the law of the Lima, which is do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. That means God's law is out. And that's what it's all about here. This, the Hellfire Club, is a war on the law of God. It's a war on any moral restraint. Its goal is to reduce society to much what we see today. Uh, and and it's still swirling down the sewer as we speak. And we know what Jesus said. I think not, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. 
For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And we cannot help but recognize the modern theological bent of the so-called evangelical church in their disregard and all but total nullification of God's law. This is nothing but one of the outcries of this very thing. And we see we've talked about the grace revolution, which is nothing but the sin revolution that uh, goes in, uh, that is so popular in the biggest churches here in the United States that grace covers everything. You know, so uh, there's nothing you can do that will ever separate you from God. And this creates a little hellfire club in people's minds that, yeah, well, I can do what I will and still go to heaven and people are going to do what they will. And uh, it's because their hearts have never been changed and regenerated. There's definitely little versions of hellfire clubs in churches as well. I mean, when you really think about it, too, I mean, in frat part of fraternities, all these different organizations, there's miniature versions of these hellfire clubs that just catch and gather everybody like them. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, well, I could tell some stories I won't. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that uh, what John says is very true. There is um, much, much, much that goes on that shouldn't. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 18, wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. And when a bad apple and a sinner, whether it's in an assembly that gathers together to worship the Lord, whether whatever situation is, you get one of these stinkers uh, in the midst of something, it's amazing the absolute destruction that they can cause. And uh, the word of God is always is so true. Now, here's a fella here that had his own little war on the law of God, Mr. Sabbatai Zevi, and we have talked about this fellow before, John, and we've done an entire broadcast on, on Mr. Zevi not that long yeah. ago on the Midnight Ride. I think we called it the Kabbalah Wizards. Is that right? Yeah, Flight of the Kabbalah Wizards, I believe. And we actually, I think we did that one on Rumble, David, because it was just some of the stuff that we described on that was a little bit... Um, too hard for YouTube, I think, you know, but possibly. But, man, you know, I think people should check it out for sure over on Rumble. What an awesome broadcast. That book is uh, really eye-opening, I think, in a lot of ways. There are other books that that detail uh, some of this stuff, but that one did a really good job of tying all of that, um, what you're talking about here, that twisting of the law into modern secret societies and into uh, how governments are ran. Yeah. And the, con and the book John's referring to here is um, 1666, Redemption Through Sin. There it is by Robert Seffer. And um, Mr. Zebe, he proclaimed himself to be the Messiah in 1666. And he believed in the concept of the holy sinner. And he, he would say that the more... The bigger the act of sin you commit, that the more it showed the glory of God in forgiving you. And I mean, they were in for wife swapping. He would, uh, and Joseph Frank after him, uh, Joseph Frank, they continued in the Frankest. And I mean, they would uh, literally give their children out for sex to other people, wife swap. There's nothing that they would not do. And for Mr. Zebi, who based what he did upon the Kabbalah, uh, this, this is something that became very, very popular. Um, one little excerpt here, and we're going to talk about uh, the Festival of the Lamb uh, in just a moment. But I'll read a little excerpt here from this book, which we, we read uh, for research for this. It's the secret history of the Hellfire Club. And in laying the foundation for this, you cannot leave out Mr. Sabotage Zebe. Um, 
he wrote this, uh, Mr. Joffrey Ash, on page 24 of this book. He says, it was not a long step from this soft peddling of the law to a marking down of morals in general. The Zohar, and that is the most preeminent book of the Kabbalah, the Zohar hinted that the Messiah himself, when he did come, would be outwardly evil. In the 1640s, this heady book was to inspire an actual would-be Messiah, Sabbatai Zebi of Smyrna, who promised to do away with the law. And as we have said, there was nothing that he would not do or pursue in his concept of the Holy Center. And just again, could you just imagine uh, that whenever uh, he was able to compromise a man or a woman in uh, these sexual practices that, you know, he had them, you know, I mean, he, he's got you. Could you imagine uh, giving uh, a child to someone to have sex with? I mean, that's how bad this was. It's ever bit this bad and more. You talk about a, a hellfire club set on the fire of hell. That's what it is. And you see, all of these things, they have this common flavor. God's law must go. It's, and that war on God's law is still on, isn't it? And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, uh, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And that word wicked in the lexicon, this is number 459 in the Greek, and what that means is destitute of the law, destitute of the Mosaic law, departing from the law, a violator of the law, lawless. And literally, this is the false prophet, that he will, his program is no law. And this certainly was the ideal pro platform for Sabbatai Zebi to proclaim himself to be the, the false, the, 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 the beast doing away with God's law. And, you know, sometimes uh, I almost think I'm a little too hard on these dispensationalists, but when you think about them, I'm not hard enough. This is nothing but the beast agenda. And whenever you denigrate God's law, even the least bit, you have bitten into this beast agenda. God's moral law will stand, and it will stand against all the attacks of these pagan devils, and the churches today are playing right into the game plan of the Hellfire Club. Do away with God's law. And this is the absolute revealed biblical agenda of the beast himself to do away with the law of God. And that's really important for them to be able to do anything that they're doing here you know if you were a follower of the law you're not going to find yourself in a place like this you know the bible it's it's very clear that they use alcohol as one of the main things too to kind of get people to go there it it's almost reminds you of a modern day bar uh and i'm not saying all bars are hell, hellfire clubs now but if you think about it during those time periods when they had these clubs there was a big divide between what purists were and what absolute pagans were. There's a big divide there. So having a place that people could drink and act foolish and belligerent would have been a huge act against the church at that time. There's no doubt about it. And now it's just aligned with the church almost. And sometimes the churches don't mind. They go and frequent some of these places, some of the people in the church. And so the law being done away with, um, according to the church, makes it so easy for it to flourish. And you know that's why the Scripture tells us to be sober, be vigilant because the devil is like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour or devour. And so who, who better than to somebody to stumble along because they didn't follow God's law. They didn't want to follow God's law and they stumbled themselves into a situation where they are a part, I guess, a uh, accidental Satanist by, uh, all of a sudden. And we, we're, we're studying this tonight in the backdrop of the way that there has been social transformation. And just think about what happened. One of the big change agents in about 1920 here in America was John Dewey. And John Dewey uh, 
introduced the concept of moral relativism into the public school system. And basically, there's no moral absolutes. You know, there, there is no definitive. We can no longer use that outmoded Bible to give us moral absolutes of absolute right and wrong. Uh, you know, your truth isn't my truth, da-da-da-da-da, the whole the on and on they go. And it now there's not even a moral absolute if you're a little boy or a little girl. You know, we can't even say that for sure. You know, we have Supreme Court justices can't define what a woman is. You know, this is where this is going. And it starts with the change agent. And the change is against the moral standards of God. Yep. And whenever we budge one little bitty inch from the absolute final authority, the word of God and God's law and the doctrine of Christ, we have become a part of the problem instead of the solution. Mm -hmm. And that is our job. We are to stand for the absolute unchanging norms and standards of God and it's all it all comes down to that Satan wants to change society into his image and uh, away from the standards of God it's that simple that's what we're looking at here one of the original change agents that I can remember in the Bible was this Balaam and Balak situation oh yeah that's the change situation where a hellfire club you know and we're just speaking in terms that modern day terms but a hellfire club basically landed there and the, where the children of israel were and promoted prostitution all those different things and it's basically changing the society to a way it could be judged god wasn't going to punish or he wasn't going to curse israel but because of their own sins because of whatever change agents were brought in the bible tells us that it's because of the teachings of balaam teaching balak to cast a stumbling block yeah. that these people were cursed by God. Yeah. In the letters to the seven churches, Jesus said, um, I have somewhat against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel to teach and seduce my servants. Yeah, Jezebel was a change agent bringing in false doctrine. And there are these people, you see them at work all the time. You see them in chat rooms. They want to spread their agenda. They want to spread their demonic filth. They want to do everything they can to bring their poison and their leaven with them wherever they can go. I'll read just a little bit here from this book by Robert Seffer, uh, 1666, uh, Redemption Through Sin, and read just a little bit about sabotage Zevi and uh, after him Joseph Frank and like John said we did a complete uh, midnight ride on the and it's amazing because this Joseph Frank was there with Rothschild and Adam Weishaupt at the founding of the Illuminati so this is really really important concepts and history there on that um, the flight of the Kabbalah wizards, I believe we called it. But uh, it says here, uh, it is thought by some scholars, this is on page 16 of Mr. Sever's book, it is thought by some scholars that Zevi had deeper connections with the Sufi order. Some similarities between the Sabbatee and Don May include the deliberate violation of, uh, of the halal ritualistic group sex or wife swapping a static singing chanting and belief in the mystical kabbalah a celebration on the 22nd day of the hebrew month of adar known as the festival of the lamb they said that the violation of the torah had become its fulfillment which they illustrated by the example of a grain of wheat that rots in the earth that's how much they hated um the god's law and it says that it ended in total darkness with religious sexual sharing of daughters and wives uh, and a little note here J jacob frank and he was the successor of sabotai zebi and he started the secret society called the uh the don may and uh, on page 17 Mr. Seffer writes, Jacob Frank, whose followers regularly sought redemption through infamous religious sex orgies on solstices and equinoxes. 
Now, isn't it amazing? And of course, we've done so much in so many broadcasts about how the the solstice and the equinox, these are the highest times of the satanic revelings, uh, whether it be witchcraft or the Don May or whatever. And that and so what 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 does the church do? And the, instead of doing the the feast of God that the Bible says to do, let's not do that. Let's do the equinoxes and the solstices. It's absolute insanity. But when you do away with the law of God, I guess you can do what thou wilt, can't you? That's exactly it, man. That's such a such an interesting thought too. You know, this time of year, I didn't see hardly any mainstream churches talking about trumpets or atonement or, or Feast of Tabernacles, but a lot of them already have their Halloween decorations up, man. And so it's amazing the how far we've fallen and people don't even see it. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to um, have their trunk or treat parties, get ready for that. Well, I tell you what we're going to do on Halloween Eve on FOJC, we're going to have a prayer thon. We're going to have a throw the devil in the trunk prayer thon. <laughs> so we're going to. Now, in Jude 12, it's interesting here because we, we see, and this goes way back. I could bring morals and dogmen here that talked about a counterfeit Passover that was practiced in Egypt before the time of Christ. But it says in Jude 12, these are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, which means at one time they were true believers. They died, they were born dead, they were born again, then they died again. We're talking about apostates here. And it just really seems to be that when it comes time for the feasts of God, that Satan absolutely will go all out in an assault with every squirrel that he can pull out of the forest. It just never fails. Um, in 2 Peter 2.13, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. And these change agents and these people that would promote wickedness and debauchery and lawlessness, they would come in to the early celebrations of the feast. And oh, yeah, the early church celebrated the feasts of God. We could bring our books out and show you that one. And they would come into the agape love feast. A little sinner destroyeth much good. This is a program that we can see going on in the time of the New Testament. And it's one that continues on. It is indeed the program of the Hellfire Club. In Daniel 7, 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, the beast, that is, and shall wear out the saints, anybody getting weary out there, of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. This is another one of the primary satanic agendas to change the times and laws. This is something that there's an undeniable pattern here. We'll do away with God's times and we'll just have ourselves a little satanic party and then we'll say it's okay because the real laws do what you will. And this is a consistent program that we can see that they have been implementing for many, many, many years. Now, there's another fella here that as we look at the history of the Hellfire Clubs that we need to take a look at, Mr. John D. And Mr. John D. was a really, really interesting fellow. I'll read just a little bit about Mr. D. from the Secret History of the Hellfire Clubs by Mr. Joffrey Ash. And it said, D is a difficult man to labor. The word magician, though correct, is inadequate. He was astrologer royal to Elizabeth I. He was an early propagandist of overseas expansion to first employ the phrase British Empire. He was an active, valued secret agent foreshadowing not only James Bond, but even the famous code number 007 in 1550. 
55, he was arrested for plotting to kill the queen with black magic. He was quite the guy. And he used uh, the uh, a mirror, the, the magic mirror concept of scrying. It goes back to John D. He was a master occultist. And some of the rituals that we're going to look here is important. And we have here a picture of John D. and Edward Kelly summoning spirits in a graveyard. And what they would do, and Edward Kelly would summon the spirits, and then John D. would interrogate them. And they said that the language that these spirits were speaking to them were Enochian. And they developed, and the, it would kind of roll. Uh, Mr. Kelly would summon it. John D. would interrogate it. And then Kelly would get the interpretation. It's a demonic tongue and interpretation. And from this were developed what the, has been known in Golden Dawn Ritual Magic and also in the Satanic Bible as the Enochian Calls. And these are the, the high invocations of the dark powers of the satanic realm. And there again, poor old Enoch. Remember, first Enoch, good. Second and third, you better stay away from it. Totally, totally spiritually toxic. And one of the things that was emphasized from these uh, devils that were communicating with John D. and Edward Kelly was do what thou wilt was the whole of the law. It was made plain to them that this was the real law of God. And here again, we have the reemphasization. It started with Mr. Rebles, do what they wilt, and then it come down demonically and supernaturally revealed to uh, Mr. Kelly and Mr. John D., and this laid the foundation for the next step forward of the formation of the next Hellfire Club that would uh, continue uh, this way of operation. But I tell you what, what were these guys thinking, John? I mean, they, uh, you know, it's frightening to think people go to this depth of evil, but they do. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, John D. being a kind of a 007 agent because obviously the, this agencies, the intelligence agencies, they use this style uh, to collect in information and material, you know, also the, his ties, you were talking earlier about his ties with America. And also, if you look at like Francis Bacon, he wasn't an actual member of the Hellfire Club, but he was a member of uh, Brotherhood of St. Francis of Wycombe, Order of the Knights of West Wycombe, and the Order of uh, Friars of St. Francis of West Wycombe, which were very similar and um, had had a lot of that stuff going on. So there, a lot of the people that formed our country um, and I'm sure you're going to get to a lot more of that, but they were um, invested in this stuff. They were all in. <laughs> they were all in. I guarantee you. Uh, my goodness. Now, this is this is again. This is where the tower meets the road. Matthew twenty six forty two. He he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, "Oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it." thy will be done. Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father. And when we are born again, our stubborn, stubborn will is broken from self and is submitted unto the law and the will of God. We'll look at that word Thelema. And the Abbey of Thelema was originated, as we said, by Franciscus Rebelis, and this was made popular in our time through Aleister Crowley, the law of the Lima, do what thou wilt, the whole of the law. And Mr. Crowley had his own Abbey of the Lima in Italy, and Mussolini kicked Aleister Crowley. You know, Mussolini wasn't known for high morals, but Mussolini kicked Aleister Crowley deported him, kicked him out of Italy, and then he went to Pasadena, California, and he started the first OTO chapter in Pasadena, California, which uh, L. Ron Hubbard and uh, the Rocket Man, um, Jack Parsons, were a part of that original OTO chapter out there in Pasadena, California. And uh, 
this actual word Philemon, well, what got Cali, Crowley kicked out, he would have these do what thou wilt parties out there at his abbey at the Lima. And there was a teenage girl. She was a very in her early teens. And she was walking back into town from Crowley's Abbey at the Lima. And she was just so drugged and abused that she just died and just laid there by the side of the road. And uh, Mussolini himself deported Aleister Crowley uh, at that point. And of course, America will we'll take him. Mm-hmm. You know, there you go. But one of the biggest change agents of all time. Now, that word Thelema, number 2307 in Thayer's lexicon, and it means absolutely that which a person wills and chooses to do. And the will of man is totally bent towards self. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the only thing that will break our stubborn fallen nature away from self. It's repenting of sin, bowing the knee to Christ as Lord, and accepting the payment, the death of Christ upon the cross as payment for our sin debt. That will give us new birth. That will give us a desire to do what is right instead of what is wrong. A person always does what they want to do. If you see a person sinning, that's because they want to do it. And until we're changed to where our want to is changed, um, we're going to keep doing what we wilt. And that it will be an un, unending spiral that will go down to the very pits of hell, quite literally. Mm-hmm. Now, this fella here, Sir Francis Dashwood, he established in the 1700s in England what they called the Abbey of Mendelham. And this is the Hellfire Club that most people are most familiar with. This was tremendously influential. And they're one of the most famous uh, frequenters of the Hellfire Club was Mr. Benjamin Franklin. And we're going to give you a little more of the history there. And you can just see there, the this was, uh, there was caves built underneath an abbey. And it was called Mendelham Abbey. And you can see here the one face with the upside down cross. It in, I mean, we're talking satanic rituals, every kind of sexual debauchery you could imagine. And it was full blown. They were down there in their cave, do what thou wilt. And uh, they were protected because some of the most elite and powerful men in England and America were were participating in that. So we're going to play a little video here on uh, the Hellfire Caves from Hidden History, and we're going to let uh, we're going to watch a little bit bit of this, and it'll get us caught up here a little bit with some of the history of the Hellfire Club. So here we go. They were said to have hired, um, how shall I put this to maintain the monetizational and algorithmic integrity of this video, ladies of the night, evening women, femme de la nuit. Anyway, these um, practitioners of the oldest profession were said to have dressed as nuns in debauched episodes in the expansive central chamber. This was known as the Banqueting Hall. In it, they were surrounded by strange carvings of skulls, statues of female goddess figures from classical Greece, and even a recreation of the river Styx from Greek mythology, the river to the underworld. Members of the Hellfire Club wore white flowing robes and adopted religious titles like Abbot. They wore masks and a badge with the club's motto, Libertati Amicatiae Sac, Sacred to Liberty and Friendship. Although another motto would also be attributed to the club, Fese que tu voudrais, do what thou wilt, a phrase that would later be adopted by the infamous occultist Elise de Crowley. No one really knows exactly what took place at these meetings, which were kept highly secret, but they could have included pagan practices, occult rituals, and even black magic and devil worship. The official guidebook rather glosses over some of the more lurid tales of debauchery, but the author, one Sir Francis Dashwood, 11th Baronet of West Wickham, a descendant of the cave's builder, is either sticking scrupulously to the verifiable facts, or perhaps seeking to defend the family name. 
it makes for an interesting read nonetheless. So who was a party to the meetings at the caves? This again is open to interpretation, but is likely to have included the artist William Hogarth, radical journalist John Wilkes, John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, the judge and antiquarian Robert Vansittart, and perhaps most significantly, considering what happened in 1776, US founding father, pioneer of electrical science and serial philanderer Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was a close associate of Dashwood, and together, when relations between the American colonies and the home government deteriorated, they endeavoured to bring about a reconciliation. Franklin, who visited the caves on a number of occasions, had hoped that America would develop within the British Empire, and by its growth become the centre of the empire, without struggle or bloody revolution. In 1770, the pair drew up a plan of reconciliation as an attempt to find a basis for compromise which might avert any open conflict towards independence. The plan was ultimately unsuccessful, and the rest, as they say, is history. But was the seed of the independence movement born in the Hellfire Club meetings and banquets in these caves? John. Okay. But isn't it amazing that Miss and Francis Dashwood and Benjamin Franklin were very close friends. When Franklin was in England, he stayed in Dashwood's home. And there were actually talks during the Revolutionary War, and uh, we might call it a plan, for America to stay under the British rule negotiated by Dashwood and Franklin. Some people theorize that that actually happened. You know, it makes you wonder with some of the things we're seeing and some of the things we've talked about in regard to what we see going on with Prince Charles and the Committee of 300. But that's amazing to me, John, that they actually, it's a known fact that Franklin and Dashwood, yeah, let's let's do us a little satanic ritual. Uh, let's just uh, have an orgy. Then let's sit down and let's plan the future of America here. Yeah, I bet, uh, I bet that'll work out probably just about like with what we got today, you know? Yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to think that they didn't plan all of this out. You know, one of the, it sounded so good. Freedom sounds really, really good uh, when people are good. It sounds great when people are good and they're not trying to out, you know, rape everybody, rob everybody, do nasty stuff. It sounds great, but the kind of people that were wanting freedom may not have been the kind of people that we think they were. It's starting to look like. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I think it was John Adams that said, uh, we have a republic if we can keep it. Yeah. And a republic will protect the rights of the few against the rights of the many. And um, I'm, I'm afraid we've done and lost that. We've done and lost that. But we've got another video here. This is another one of the Hellfire Clubs. The, uh, like the, the concept started with Rebles and um, the Duke of Wharton. Uh, actually had the first Hellfire Club in England, then Mr. Dashwood, and at the same time we had these Irish boys. They had their Hellfire Club, and they were totally off the hook. I mean, they a lot more got out about what went on in this Hellfire Club. I mean, there were things like episodes where they would get so out of control that uh, in one instance, they doused a guy with brandy and set him on fire. I mean, they would just get totally crazy. And some of the stories that were told there and how, and, you know, and why uh, do these things go on uh, and no one gets punished? Well, that's what we got now, don't we, right here in America? Outrageous yeah. crime goes on. Uh, just from Mr. Biden, like uh, we're talking $21 million from foreign countries, you know, no one gets punished. The same thing here. They'd pour brandy on people and set them on fire because the people here, they were the elite and the powerful that were doing what they will. The whole is the law. It's the same old story, the same old song and dance. You ready to play this? Dude? Let's play it. Let's look at the little history the, during those years. The Hellfire Club. It's a spooky, like a family spending a nice afternoon at the Hellfire Club. Let's go. 
They held dark masses there, engaged in debaucherous behavior, drank a mixture of whiskey and butter, and always held an empty seat for the devil himself. The mascot for the Hellfire Club was a black cat, and supposedly a large black demon cat roams the woods surrounding the Hellfire Club on this hill. So, that's fun. There are tales of human and animal sacrifices, satanic rituals, and demonic manifestations. Well, this is a big room. Shut up, kid. So this is the fireplace of the building, and when they were building this, they used stones from an old cairn, a prehistoric Irish tomb, to build it. That's why it's cursed, and supposedly the stones from it used here, put here, from the tomb. That's why it's cursed. It's pretty creepy, it's so small. Yeah. Another story about the club concerns a young farmer who, curious to find out what went on at the meetings, climbed up Montpellier one night. He was found by the members of the club, dragged into the building, and allowed to see the night's activities. He was found the next morning, wandering the area, unable to speak, and they say he spent the rest of his life deaf and dumb, unable to even remember his own name. Another story tells of how the club kidnapped, murdered, and then ate a local farmer's daughter. Here's another story. A young visitor to the local farmhouse insisted on going to investigate the Hellfire Club. He was found dead the next day, lying face down in a mountain stream. His host believed that the boy had been murdered, and he asked the clergyman to accompany him to the Hellfire Club. When they got to the club, darkness was falling. They knocked on the door, and it was opened by a tall, black-cloaked man. When they entered the building, they were immediately grabbed from behind and hustled into the dining room. A banquet was about to begin, so the two men were pushed into chairs. A majestic looking black cat stalked into the room and took his place at the head of the table. The priest noticed that the ears of the cat were not erect, but lying like horns at either side of the head. The wide, deep eyes glared hatred at the priest, who rose to his feet, intending to leave the devilish assembly. He was grabbed and pushed back into his chair. Realizing that he had a small bottle of holy water in his pocket, he threw it with all possible force at the cat, while at the same time, he recited an exorcism. Chaos erupted, but in the middle of it all, could be heard the terrified screams of the farmer. The priest continued to pray until the smell of sulfur and smoke forced him to leave the building. Outside, he found the farmer lying on the ground, his face and neck deeply scratched by strong claws. He never recovered. According to legend, the next morning, the burned out Hellfire Club stood a ruin on the hilltop, as it does today. Supposedly, well, there you spirits go. and demons still lurk in the building Sorry about that. I'm and the surrounding. Well, file that under all kinds of creepy. I tell you, just looking at this gives you creepy feeling, doesn't it, John? Yeah, it does, man. That's a creepy place. I can imagine, you know, who I, I don't even want to imagine the kind of stuff that went on there, but I know that for somebody to have the guts to walk up on there probably wasn't very, it was probably pretty rare for somebody to actually be able to have the guts to walk up on there. And another thing I was just thinking about this is like, I can imagine with people like, Ben Franklin and looking at these characters it was they probably had a hard time getting girls there unless they had somebody procuring these girls I can't imagine that they girls were willingly going into this place with these creepy looking dudes yeah and like it is said there in the other one they were they were prostitutes yeah and they were paid for what they did and 
Yeah, I tell you, it's um, it's uh, it's it's quite the thing to think about. And um, there was it was actually the E Network that uh, did a series called the Secret Societies of Hollywood. And they talked about what they were. They were little hellfire clubs, and they showed several places that were secluded mansions where, you know, it's a shut scenario like the Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman movie, where literally the Hollywood A-listers, you could go there and do what thou wilt. And I mean anything that thou wilt, thou could do there. And these places are now well-known. Uh, out there uh, for the Hollywood A-listers. They know where these Hellfire Clubs are, and that's all they are. They're just Hellfire Clubs. These things, there there are so many European mansions, uh, many of them uh, owned by the Rothschilds and secluded areas. That's how these people roll. That's how they roll, and it's been going on for a long time. And they have done their job well. They've done their job well. Yeah. This fella here, we can't leave out Mr. Crowley. And uh, this is a picture of Aleister Crowley in his Masonic regalia. And we cannot miss the connection here with Freemasonry. The very first um, Hellfire Club was uh, founded by Philip, Duke of Wharton, who became the Grand Master of all Freemasonry. And Aleister Crowley was not just a Freemason but he was a celebrated Freemason. This man was so sick and depraved, he would do, uh, he promoted uh, human sacrifice. I, I can't even talk, I wouldn't even want to talk about the things this guy did, but he would make Satanists, other Satanists sick. They couldn't keep up with this guy. You talk about just a sick, demonic perv. You can't beat this guy. Yeah. You can't beat this guy. And at the time he was doing this, he was receiving Masonic honors all over. Now, how does that happen? Because the same way, you know, a little Alistair, he can hook you up with some evil. But once Alistair hooks you up with some evil, he's got you. And it was said of Mr. Crowley and what he said of himself in his autobiography, he said, I move in the air of British aristocracy. And he certainly did. And in his book, in this book, Confessions of Aleister Crowley, you, it, he talks about how that Carl Kellner and Theodore Roos, two German fellows in the German OTO, that they recruited him out of Freemasonry into the OTO. And within uh, Freemasonry, and this goes all the way back to Adam Weishoff, Adam Weishoff was a Jesuit, and then he founded the Illuminati, and then he joined Freemasonry because he saw Freemasonry as the vehicle to propagate his change agents of Illuminism. And within the, the broad structure of Freemasonry, there was the Golden Dawn, that was totally, it was founded and started and propagated and run by Freemasons. We had the Ordo Templar Orientis. Uh, Carl Kellner and Theodore Roos were both German Freemasons. They recruited Freemason Aleister Crowley into it, and they used Freemasonry to propagate it. And, and here's the deal. If, um, if a person's a Satanist and you're in the local lodge, down downtown and you see somebody that you think might go along with a, a little plunge down the dark side and you invite them to a ritual well even if the person says no they have sworn a death oath before they come into the door not to say a word about what goes on in that lodge that lodge that the chief of the police and the judges and the politicians go to this is how this thing has come down and propagated for a long long time satan has used the hellfire clubs and secret societies to compromise people to control people and it's going right now at a breakneck speed. Yeah, and there's no mistaking when I, I feel I the way I think of it too is like this is, and we said I said this earlier, but it's such a good way for them to see who's part of their team because let's face it, you th these people that say that they entered the Illuminati in order to expose it, 
they had to be pretty dang wicked and evil themselves to get themselves to that point because the stuff that they had to do in order to even get themselves to a point to where 33rd degree was on the table, um, there was some stuff. There, there was stuff before that 33rd degree initiation guaranteed that they knew that this person was the right person. And that's why, you know, that's why it's like every time I hear somebody say that th they're a previous 33rd degree Freemason, it might be the case, but if, um, if they didn't die or get thrown in prison after the fact, it's hard for me to believe it. You know, like Captain Morgan, for instance, that was a, that's, a, that's an, that is somebody that I could probably say this guy was legitimately a 30, 30 degree and came forth from it because he was ended up being killed for, you know, the stuff that he said about it. But it's interesting, man. Like they, they can, they can sense it out. Evil senses evil. It's just like when you go to a, a place where let's say um, some people are interested in, knitting and you end up finding the people that are interested in knitting and then you start getting together with the people who are knitting and then you find out who the hardcore knitters are and it just keeps on going right and i know knitting's not probably most people that are listening here aren't aren't, aren't uh looking for hardcore knitting people partners but that's just the way it works <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and there and i know john and i are thinking of the same guy here and uh there's a guy out there that um 33rd degree Freemason is a member of the OTO and, but he's a good Freemason, a good OTO guy. Yeah. And he's going to tell us the truth. And John and I will quote Gerald Gardner, who was a 33rd degree Freemason because of him telling the secrets of what's going on so mm -hmm. that we can understand and figure out their agenda and expose it. But in no way would we bring Gerald Gardner or these other toe heads on and say, Oh yeah, he's a good guy. Uh -huh. He's going to tell you the truth. He's going to fight the devil. Uh -uh. No. no. And boy, we could drop I mean, there's some big so-called Christian ministries that have uh, tried to promote this guy as a good guy. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, that ain't going to happen here. Ain't going to happen here. You got, like John says, you don't, you don't, you don't get there, um, and have clean hands and a pure heart. No, no. you don't. And people can repent and come out, but when you repent, you're going to renounce it. You're going to, you're going to repent. You're going to renounce it. And, uh, you're going to come out of it and renounce it for the evil demonic mess that it is. And I think they're either going to kill you or you're going to pay the price they're gonna there's no way that they're doing these rituals and stuff and they're not filming they're not show they're not waiting for the time to where it's like you remember that day you remember that day then we had that ritual you remember that day when that prostitute came by well here's a here's a video man i found of you with that prostitute and with that in that ritual are you ready to were you sure you're ready to leave are you sure because you know this is what happens when you leave and this that's why it's like, yeah, they, they may repent and they come out. I believe that that's possible, but I don't believe they're coming out without that footage being revealed, without something being done to them. And when they get to that level, I really don't. Like, I just don't see it. Yeah, maybe 32nd degree down below, but once they get to that 33rd degree, they've already done some things that are beyond the point of no return as far as maybe not forgiveness from God, but beyond the point of return being able to live a life where they can just wander around the streets. I just don't believe that's possible. It's like the mafia. You Once you're in, you're in type thing. You know, I really believe that. At least at 30, 30 degree. I could be wrong, but I just can't see them letting people like that get to that point without them knowing for sure that that person's on their team. I just can't see it. Yeah. Um, some of you remember the what happened in Matamoros, Mexico. Uh, been several years ago now. And Madame Morris is right across um, the border, and it's a popular spring break destination mm -hmm. down at Madame Morris. And there was a place discovered there where there was a cauldron that had, I, I man, it was like a dozen different parts of bodies in a cauldron where they were, they were doing Palo Mayambe, human sacrifice. And drug traffickers would do rituals with human sacrifice, and they would believe it would make them invisible. And uh, and the, the kind of the way it would go, and you know the old game that's been played and is still played, you know, well, invite the, the, local, the local mayor over and get him good and drunk and then just let him go with the girl and we'll just videotape it and there we got him. But wh what they would do 
they would they would just bring everybody in and they'd be standing around a table and they'd be video videoing it and all of a sudden there's a child laid in on the table and its throat's cut just like that and there they are they're videotaped with the the, the human ritual sacrifice of a child they own them for life mm -hmm. and um i tell you what letting down your moral guard um in it, whatever station in life you are, the devil will get you. He wants you to, uh, he, he, you know, he's out there seeking to devour you. He really is. And, um, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Now in this book here, the life and times of a modern witch by Janet and Stuart for and they wrote the witch's Bible. They're not little players in the game. They're big ones. Uh, in the world of the occult. And I want to read something here on page uh, 121 of this book. And it says here, uh, it is generally agreed that the biggest single influence in the modern expansion of ritual magic and the occult explosion in general in the Western world was the golden dawn now that's quite a statement isn't it yeah. the reason the, have you seen the occult explosion lately uh the occult just taken totally over and according to these elite witches that it was the golden dawn that propagated that going on they says this magical fraternity founded by Freemasons at the end of the 19th century, developed a compl complex ritual system with 10 degrees of initiation relating to the Kabbalistic Sephiroth. Now, we've got a little pattern there. We keep seeing Kabbalah. We keep seeing Freemasonry. Going on, the Golden Dawn rituals, originally highly secret, were eventually published and are the basis of of several still existing fraternities and groups little little um little change agents there now some of the people involved in the golden dawn alistair crowley was in the golden dawn uh arthur edward wait is another fella he is a huge player um i could bring in a stack of books that mr wait wrote that were occult classics uh, he wrote uh, a history of Freem He wrote a Masonic encyclopedia, and he also wrote a textbook on black magic. You know, and a lot uh, used to in seminars, I'd hold these two up side by side. Yeah, uh, do we see a connection here? And the connection between Freemasonry and these totally dark groups and these totally dark people—it's undeniable. I mean, good grief! And this book here, this is just one example of how not only was the Golden Dawn the disseminator, and, well, we've got Crowley, we've got A.E. Waite, S.L. McGregor Mathers, who translated many of the Kabbalistic works into English. Um, just the major league players in the dark world were in the Golden Dawn, and they, they were change agents to the max. They were great at it. And um, I'll read just a little bit here. Uh, from this book, The Hidden Church of the Holy Grail. We also did a complete midnight ride on The Hidden Church of the Holy Grail. And basically, and what Mr. Waite did in this book, which is called The Hidden Church of the Holy Grail, he maintains that within Catholicism, there is a secret society that is doing the real mass. And, they, and I'll just read uh, what it says here on page 66. It says, um, as the secret words of consecration, the extra efficacious words which must be pronounced over the sacramental elements so that they may be converted into the arch natural. You have been rightly in a lost or hypothetical book. It follows that since the grail was withdrawn from the world together with its custodians, the Christian church has had to be content with what it has, namely a substituted sacrament. And what they're saying is that the Catholic church, that they just have the phony mass, and it, it is not 
the mass isn't good in the Catholic Church. We know that and understand it. But they're saying that we got the real words and we've got the real mass. And when they would do this grail mass, there would be supernatural demonic miracles. And we've talked about a long time the prophesying of the false communion that will come when this will be actually will take over and it says in the book of Daniel that the false prophet a host will be given unto him literally what they call the wafer in the communion but just a little bit of the excerpts of uh, what happens at this false mass on page 35 it says they secured from this priest of a neighboring church who had celebrated mass on a neighboring on a certain occasion, and had seen the consecrated elements converted into flesh and blood. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of accounts. They would, they would see a mystical child appear and enter into the host. They would see symbols appear on the bread. I mean, we're talking about a Luciferian mass. We're talking about, and we actually wrote a book called Luciferian Transmutation about this, this entire subject. This is the stuff. There's change agents working within Catholicism, which is rotten anyway, to, to totally make it full-blown Luciferian. There are change agents within Freemasonry, which is rotten anyway, that is just getting more rotten. What can you say? And what we have seen, and here is the foil of it all, we have the people that are professing Jesus Christ instead of holding the line and saying, yes, the word of God's real. Yes, God's law is real. They have thrown in the towel. They have thrown in the towel and they have given in with the tide that these hellfire clubs are sweeping our society totally down, totally down into the sewer. Mm, so true, David. It's, it's unfortunate, too, because people get caught up in it that don't, are, are really uh, assuming you young men can get so easily caught up in these things, man, you know. Uh, and David, I know that you probably heard stories of people going to parties and then next thing you know, they've stumbled across something like this. And, and I've heard uh, testimonies of people that went to a party and they almost ended up being a sacrifice. Yeah. But this is the kind of stuff that in Proverbs, you know, for instance, in chapter, I think it's eight and nine, it talks about the woman who, uh, the war woman wisdom who calls, calls out for everybody to take her by the hand. Right. And then it has the other woman. The other woman who represents foolishness calling other people by the hand and you have these two dichotomies and i don't believe there's a middle ground i really don't believe there's a middle ground i think that there's black and then there's white and then in the middle of the gray doesn't exist so they people would like you to think that you can be both uh, in the darkness and in the light at the same time like in freemasonry raised in the dark and in the light but the fact of the matter is you're either going after the woman of wisdom like it says in proverbs or you're going after the woman of foolishness like it says in proverbs and the woman of foolishness it even says in there that her ways lead lead to death it leads to the to the rephaim it leads to demons and darkness and it, it says that and it's it's amazing that people think oh, i'll never get caught up in something like this or like this but you don't you know when you mix alcohol you mix drugs you mix uh, women, you mix whatever the the case may be, whatever your vice is, you mix those things together. The stuff isn't far away from it. I really believe that it's not far away. There's probably been parties that I've been to where this stuff has been going on in the background, not even known it was there. This is this stuff is not far behind debauchery. It's not far behind drunkenness. It's not far behind um, orgies and all of that stuff. That's why the Bible calls them works of the flesh. I guarantee you that I have heard far too many of these stories in Evansville, Indiana, when we lived there and worked for years uh, with people coming out of the occult there, far too many of them. It is, um, I mean, it is, it is just so prevalent that is frightening. Um, and you know, what John said is so true. You're either obedient to the doctrine of Christ and the commandments of God and God's law, you're not. It, you're just like a belly, but belly button. You're an any or you're an outie. Mm -hmm. There's no in between. You're either, if you're not in submission and obedience to the doctrine of Christ and the commandments of God, 
you know, you're you're a part of the problem. You're yep. not a part of the solution and you're not in a right place with the Lord. You're in the wrong place. Yeah. We're going to look here at a book that and we've featured this um, because it's so important. We were talking about how that Blavatsky and Bailey led better and Besant and the whole theosophical hierarchy that they believed they were actually and I and I believe them that they were actually in uh, contact with physical entities that had manifested literally in contact with Nephilim. This was the claim of um, Benjamin Krim uh, that and and you know I frankly believe them and we we unpack their statements and claims and the feasibility of it from the spiritual realm on another midnight ride. What was the name of that one, John? Um, David, <laughs> done, I don't know. I we've don't done know. so many of them, I can't remember. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember, but I do. We've talked about this book a lot of times. I know it's really, yeah. it really is relevant to the New Age stuff. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Alice Bailey was the queen of the New Age in her day. Yeah. And her husband, Foster Bailey, he was lecturing in Masonic lodges all over the world. I have his books. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the exact title of it, but I have his book at home. He wrote on Freemasonry, still published by the McCoy Masonic Publishing Company. Mm -hmm. But this is what it says on page 511. Here comes some more change agents. She says, the three main channels through which the preparation for the new age is going on might be regarded as the church. Number one, the church, because you got to compromise the church, because if you got people standing for God's law, like Wesley and Spurgeon and the Puritans did, it's going to make it a little, little, little testy for them getting their agenda. So yeah, the three main channels through which the preparation for the new age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. There is the satanic trifecta of infiltration. My goodness, uh, we've said so much and we could never say enough about the grooming that has come in in the in the schools it's absolutely horrific uh it, I, you know it just is so disheartening and goes on to say that uh on the same page there uh the masonic movement when it can be divorced from political and social ends and from its present paralyzing condition of inertia will meet the need of those who can and should wield power. It is the custodian of the law. Mm. <laughs> now listen to that. The Masonic fraternity is the custodian of the law, not God's law, but do what thou wilt. Yeah. It is the home of the mysteries and the seat of initiation the methods of deity are demonstrated in its temple and under the all-seeing eye the work can go forward it is a far more occult organization than can be realized and is intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultist wow quite a statement isn't it yeah quite a statement and you know, you get you got to appreciate their honesty. They said, we're coming. We're coming into the church. We're coming into the lodge. We're coming into your schools. We're going to take them over. We're going to change it. And they have. Yeah. Easily. They but easily. You, you, go ahead, David. No, no go I, ahead. I, I'm I just saying. Say I, they, they easily have changed it. I mean, it made it really it, easily. They came in so without even probably without even a hand up. And we've got a situation where there's not a lot of fire and brimstone coming out of pulpits. Not a lot of fire and brimstone. Nothing gets them too excited and worked up. There's so much going on and so much needs to be said. But you know what will get them fired up? You tell them that God's law is still valid, and you tell them that those pagan holidays are demonic. Now that 
will get a fight out of them. That will get them mad. They won't get mad to fight against sin, but they will fight against the things of God if you try to bring them into their little group and expose their paganism now, we got a fight on our hands. Yeah. Yeah. A fellow we can't leave out in our discussion of Hellfire Clubs, kind of the epitome, Mr. Hellfire, Mr. Jeffrey Epstein, and the things that uh, he did are unspeakable, the way that they would groom and recruit women and uh, actually it's known that he was setting up his own selective breeding to actually do his own a good Jewish boy that was doing a selective breeding program like Hitler now uh, we won't even go into that more but the same thing he's got his little place and every place every room and every bedroom had a camera going constantly. The elite and the powerful of the world were there. And the FBI has all of those tapes. And you bet we're never going to see any of them. Because Mr. Epstein, and I know you were, you all are very intelligent. You know the people, the uh, uh, Prince Harry, the Clintons, you know, it's a laundry list of the rich and powerful that were in on this little hellfire club. And this is just a very relevant modern example of how this works and how this comes down. And if we're, if it were not for uh, Mr. Philip, Duke of Wharton, and if it were not for Mr. Francis Dashwood and these other people going before, there would be no Jeffrey Epstein. And if the Church of the Living God, the Israel of God, would have been loud and clear and have stood their ground, um, it would have been much more difficult um, for them to do what they've done. Yeah. Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Man, David, thank you so much for this broadcast tonight. I think that it's so important to be able to know our enemy and not only know him, but be aware of what's going on. Be aware of the change agents and where they operate in, what kind of spirit and what kind of fruits they operate in. And this tells a lot, man. This tells a whole lot. When you start seeing weird stuff like this, don't just cast it off as weird behavior because it's possibly even darker and deeper than what you may think because you'd be surprised how many of these people that are part of these clubs might be within your friends group, might be within your church group, might be within your school group, might be within your chamber of commerce business group. That's how John Wayne Gacy operated. He operated within the chamber of commerce, showed pornography, got it going real, real big, and had a whole group of people helping him out. He had a bunch of skeletons in his in his uh, basement, and there's no way he could have put them all in there with his health problems. So he had a whole club of people, Hellfire Club, doing that stuff. That's what that was. That was a modern-day Hellfire Club. Uh, a lot of these guys, even a lot of these serial killers said, look, you didn't even catch the worst one. I'm just one of them. I'm just one of these guys. This, yeah. this, I'm nobody compared to how these people operate. So this is operating all around us in a lot of ways. And it's important, I think, that we we push it down as much as we can. I know that people say, well, you shouldn't be politically correct and you shouldn't get involved. You know, people have the right to choose what they want to do. And that's true. We all have the right to choose what we want to do. And one day we're all going to give account for it. But ultimately, you also have the right to choose whether somebody's acting like that in, in sort of your circle, inside of your space. If somebody's inside of your space doing horrible things like this, you have a right and you have the ability to petition God, to petition uh, anything you can to stop this stuff from happening. And I think part of the problem is that we've allowed this stuff to happen under our face for the longest time because, you know, David's been sh saying it all the time, corruption. People have been corrupted by these groups, and so they're not willing to stand up against them. But those of us that have not been corrupted by these groups, I think it's important that we do stand against them. So thank you, David, for that, man. Do you have any other 
final words you want to portray before we get off of here? Well, I want to say this, that the good news is there are thousands of you out there. There are thousands of you, and the number is growing every day that are coming into submission to Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Christ, and the commandments of God that are going to stand strong for the unchanging standards of the unchanging God that's revealed to us in Scripture. And the Lord, just like in Gideon's army, he said that everyone that's afraid go home, two-thirds of them left. But yeah. that did not prevent the Lord from bringing the victory because the battle is the Lord's. And we are so aware and so thankful for the thousands of you that are standing with the Lord and uh, uplifting the standards of the Word of God. So we have very much to be encouraged and thankful for this evening. Amen and amen. Thank you, David. And tonight, this is the point where we do the pounder's pound. This is where we pound the like button on the count of three all together, get the algorithm going. Let people know this show's worth watching. So here we go, David, on the count of three. Count us down. One, One two, two, three. three. Boom. 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 That was good. I could feel that one all the way over here. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you, all of you who support what we do and watch and subscribe and share. We could not do this without you, so please know that you are greatly appreciated, and we hope to see you guys next time on the Midnight Ride. David Ennis out here. As always, with great thankfulness to the Lord and great thankfulness unto you, our Midnight Ride listeners. We could not do what we do without you. Thank you so very much. So with that, until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.